Welcome to everybody uh, attending. Um, I know we've got uh, we've got people calling in from from all over the world. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this is the fifth episode of CGIR uh, Big Data Digital Discussion Series on COVID nineteen and food security, and the big data solutions and challenges related to that. Um, so this panel focuses on building gaps. Uh, bridging gaps and building resiliency with digital agriculture platforms. So we launched this online discussion series to bring emergent research and on the ground realities together in conversation in order to map out the direct impacts of COVID-19 across food values uh, chains and to glean data driven recommendations and solutions. So we're very welcome, very happy to welcome uh, Stephanie Dizon, a head of implementation at Farm Force. Shahid Akbar, CEO at the Bangladesh Institute of ICT Development, uh, Ashma Singh, co-founder and COO of Move Farm, and Zaytuna Mustafa from uh, marketing, the Market Engagement Manager at GCMA. Um, we'll uh, let Stephanie uh, start this panel off, so I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to Stephanie. She's the head of implementation for FarmForce, a digital solutions provider for digitizing the agricultural first mile. She has previously managed implementations for Africa and the Asia Pacific. She also leverages extensive experience in supply chain management, having worked with herbs and spices, import and export of fresh produce and retail, and has an in-depth understanding of operational requirements and challenges in the agriculture and, agriculture and fast moving consumer goods industry. Um, Stephanie is calling in from Bangkok. Thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, I'll let you I'll let you take it away. Okay, great. Thanks, Erin. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so I'll just uh, start to share my screen. Um, give me one second here. Uh, Okay. All right. Um, okay, I think you can all see it now. This, okay, great. All right, great. Okay, so I'll start us off. Um, so, uh, hi, I'm Stephanie Dizon from uh, Farm Force, and uh, Farm Force uh, is all about. Uh, building trust and transparency, translating into secure, sustainable sourcing, better farmer quality of life, and protection of the environment. So I'll be uh, taking us through just a very quick presentation today on what we do and some uh, examples that uh, solutions that have worked on the ground, and to also share uh, our learnings and and how um, how we can help build resiliency amongst uh, the um, smallholder farmers and the uh, different types of groups that we uh, work in. So FarmForce, just a very quick introduction. We are a cloud-hosted web and mobile solution, and we enable uh, the digitization of the agricultural first mile. So how it works is that we have a mobile application. Uh, it's, it's basically a, a simple and robust uh, data collection tool that's often used by your field staff members, uh, your co-op managers, and they uh, use this tool to collect data on the ground. And then when the data is synced, the uh, data is then aggregated uh, into a web portal, which allows you to see various data points that have been collected in the field. So it gives you a nice overview of the farmers, the different you know, uh, campaigns that you're managing, and also other monitoring and evaluation activities that you might have on the ground. And so we um, have worked with uh, uh, various uh, clients across uh, the world, um, as, as you can see here. And today uh, we'll talk about uh, two examples of how uh, we have um, supported clients to leverage uh, you know, remote um, capabilities in order to um, really utilize digital you know, farmer outreach tools. So uh, to share with you uh, two examples, we have here the first one, which is uh, Cargill and Cote d'Ivoire. And what we did there is that um, in April, uh, we launched uh, the uh, a survey module in order to uh, help 
uh, sen mass sensitization of um, uh, COVID-19 uh, sanitation practices um, in accordance to uh, Cote d'Ivoire government regulations. And so we, will, we were able to easily um, uh, uh, share this information amongst the field officers and COCO cooperatives uh, in order to uh, help um, uh, relay uh, information regarding uh, COVID-19. A uh, second um, uh, example is the uh, Clinton Foundation. Uh, so uh, Clinton Foundation, Tanzania, Rwanda, and Malawi uh, have used uh, farm force um, in their kind of various uh, geographies in order to safely reach uh, smallholder farmers uh, without the need for face-to-face -face interactions. And they did this by doing uh, three uh, different kind of actions. So the first is uh, using mobile communication and utilizing this. So um, in Farm Force, uh, they were able to uh, bulk SMS uh, large uh, amounts of information in order to uh, share and raise uh, awareness on COVID-19. Uh, this uh, enabled them to work remotely. Um, so what field agents did was that instead of going through uh, the different kind of uh, smallholders, they were able to uh, collect uh, survey responses using um, the uh, general kind of voice call and then logging that information through the survey module. And this enabled them to uh, create you know, data-driven decisions um, and uh, enable them to remotely collect data uh, in order to uh, rapidly roll out uh, various uh, plans and programs. And so uh, with these two uh, examples, what were some of the success factors uh, that we have uh, seen? So firstly, it's uh, very important to familiarize yourself with uh, different kind of virtual meeting spaces. We all know there's quite a lot that's available out there. Um, so it's important to familiarize yourself with all the different tools that are available. Um, and also to keep in mind that uh, 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 sessions need to be uh, conducted in shorter um, and more interactive kind of ways um, in order also to uh, prevent kind of brain fatigue. Um, we need to also be able to address uh, internet and connectivity issues. So having alternative plans in place and uh, providing um, your uh, clients or your users with different uh, customized offline manuals so that they can actually uh, read and take this information offline. Um, it's also important to ensure that you focus also on super users because one-on-one -on -one sessions with them allow you to also empower the individual users and it enables them to build uh, competencies within their teams as well. And this is quite important to getting um, uh, users to be familiar with the tools that you want to deploy. And of course, um, it's uh, also critical to have uh, systems in place where you do have global support teams that can uh, support your clients in uh, different time zones. And so the main lessons learned is that we uh, know that you know, flexibility and adaptability is key. Uh, the world is changing all the time and it's important to make sure that you're able to adapt and change as things change. And so this also leads us to the second point, which is you know, technology is, is a great tool but uh, it is not the end solution. There also needs to be programs um, uh, in place in order to uh, support uh, the end outcomes. And of course, um, the, the solutions won't uh, be possible uh, unless you have a more collaborative approach where you actually reach out to find uh, the problems uh, and also the solutions to the challenges that you have on the ground. Um, and so that, takes me to the um, end of my presentation and I, tr I tried uh, very hard to kind of keep it short and sweet um, and uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, uh, all the uh, uh, audience members and attendees, you're welcome to submit any questions at any time to Stephanie. Um, so for, for me, I, I would really love to, to ask a couple of questions myself. Um, first of all, um, I like how you you mentioned that you know flexibility and agility is key, especially when we're talking about resilience, uh, a resilient global food system. And, and another thing that you that you talked about in your presentation was um, 
it was looking at uh, the, what was that last point that you had on that on this on the slide? Uh, the uh, reach out to find problems and solutions, the collaboration. Yeah. So are you talking about um, more of like a two-way uh, communication between, you know, obviously, you know, you're presenting the solution, but I guess, does that mean that um, you were looking to more collect information about from your users on how to better service them? Or can you, can you go into that in a little bit more detail? Yeah, sure. Um, so the approach has to be a little bit uh, more different now because um, you're also dealing with um, you know, uncertainty for both, you know, your side and also your clients. So you have to make sure that you also understand what are the operational challenges. And in order for you to make, you know, any kind of deployment or any project successful, um, there needs to be a joint effort from both parties. So understanding, does this tool work? Um, does it work for certain types of uh, people on the ground? Is it not very accessible? This type of analysis needs to be conducted thoroughly in order to have that successfully uh, deployed. Mm. So one of the uh, one of the interesting outcomes uh, that we found in, in these discussions is that um, many of the uh, digital innovation providers um, they had to really they really had to had to shift their their process a little bit to be looking at what solutions um, their users were, were already using. Uh, we had a great um, discussion with one of our, actually one of our CGIR colleagues in, in, um, in Ikrisad in India. And, and he was saying that, you know, they were looking, they, they started to talk to some of their far, the farmers in that area and they were very surprised to see how they were using very simple tools to innovate because they have to, because it's, uh, I mean, obviously they, they need to adapt and they were very surprised at how they were starting to use different tools and how they, how they took some of the innovations that um, they hadn't really considered because maybe um, uh, coming from uh, a digital and, you know, data driven background where you have all of these like uh, new innovative ideas, um, but then it was actually these very simple uh, strategies using platforms like WhatsApp or or or, um, or you know high user um, high user platforms, uh, they really had to shift to see like that they needed to be talking more to um, those who they're trying to connect with. So um, so yeah, I mean, I, I I guess I would love to hear a bit more about that. Like, how did Farm Force? Were there any like surprising developments that they realized they had to kind of pivot? to to work with yeah i would love to hear a bit more yeah. about that yeah it's 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 a good question because um when um when you talk about you know shifting um especially in times of covid and also uh, uncertainty um there's always some some question around that but the really great thing about how we're structured operationally is that we already work, um, our teams are global, so we already work remotely. And so the shift to supporting our clients on a remote basis wasn't entirely new, but we did have to think about more interactive ways on, and, and more effective ways of being able to reach them. So being a little bit more creative either in, in terms of delivery of you know, a training manual or um, ensuring that sessions are, are within three hours uh, each time because also uh, because everyone has gone online, um, you don't want to have the, the digital fatigue that most of us would often get because of, you know, you're spending so much on screen time. So we had to uh, maybe um, uh, kind of improve a little bit on that part. But in terms of the operational structure, um, you know, working remotely was not something that was new for us since we've been doing this um, uh, for, for some time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, the data that you collected from the farmers through these surveys, um, uh, so you're using to support them with the training um, information resources. Um, how, so how exactly are you using, how exactly are you using that data to support them with training information and um, to minimize these disruptions to crop production and, and local food supply? 
So um, for the first example, um, there were uh, very specific um, uh, information that was um, given by uh, Cote d'Ivoire that uh, had to be disseminated to uh, many of the co-ops. And so uh, this, um, you know, uh, there were some kind of pictures that we've also shown, but this information was quite critical to ensure that um, the practices on the ground were, of course, you know, you're, 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 you're practicing social distancing, you are limiting kind of uh, uh, farmer to farmer uh, contact. And so um, this uh, was quite important to ensure also the safety of the different uh, co-ops and, and the farmers at that level. Um, so to ensure that they can still uh, manage a lot of their um, you know, crop activities if, if needed. And then for uh, Clinton Foundation, uh, bulk SMS, um, that uh, enabled them also to uh, ensure kind of social distancing measures, uh, again, to uh, also support um, their activities and making sure that uh, social distancing, again, is practiced and there's not, um, you know, the, the information is, is well kind of um, uh, disseminated across different, um, different uh, people. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Um, look, we're going to uh, move to, to introduce the next panelist. Um, for any of the attendees, uh, you're welcome to submit the questions at any time. Um, and uh, it, even if Stephanie doesn't have the time to answer them at the moment, uh, we will put them to her at the end of, at the, end of, the, of the session. Um, so uh, the next um, the next panelist uh, today is uh, Ashna Singh. Uh, she's the co-founder uh, and COO of MoFarm, a dairy technology startup building connected commerce for 100 million dairy farmers in India. She's a strong promoter of inclusive growth and is passionate about creating sustainable rural livelihoods for farmers. She's also a recipient of multiple awards, including from the Agriculture Innovation Congress and the World Bank recognizing her for her work. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Ashna. Um, please take it away. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Mariana. I'll start with the screen share. Just a second. Yep. So, um, hello, everyone. Uh, like, thank you for this such a kind introduction, Mariana. And, uh, with MoFarm, um, like you rightly said, we are a dairy technology startup building connected commerce. Of, and we are currently in India, so we, have, uh, we are all working with the vision to increase milk productivity and income for 100 million dairy farmers in India. So uh, just a bit of our uh, background of the dairy industry in India, we are the largest milk producer. So we have 187 uh, million tons of milk being produced uh, every year, uh, making it the number of number one crop by value. And of course, this is again, the population of India comes into uh, our advantage here. It's because we have the highest number of cattle. So we have 30% of the world's cattle population with 300 million uh, cattle in India. But with the keeping in mind the positive bigger picture we still have a lot of inefficiencies uh, happening in the uh, dairy industry sorry so um there's unavailability of timely and quality inputs and services, both in terms of health services as well as nutritional inputs. Uh, it's not on demand. There's, there's gap in breeding and veterinarian services. From the farmer perspective, there's lack of knowledge about appropriate cattle management practices. There is no uh, health history record keeping of their uh, farms because because when we talk about India, 95% uh, are smallholder dairy farmers with four to five cattle and the average milk productivity is just four liters. Um, there's low quality breeding. There's lack of access to organized financial services, both in terms of credit as well as insurance. So out of the 300 million cattle I'm talking about, only 9% is insured. Um, so... Uh, now, when we talk about the entire panel talking about bridging gaps, this is the gap in the Indian dairy industry. Farmers lack access to veterinary services for treatment and breeding. So all the health uh, aspects of the cattle, there's a gap in information and knowledge in nutritional inputs as well as financial services. So um, making sure how we use digital platforms and data to solve certain challenges. MoFarm has our own mobile application wherein we've digitized the 
uh, the cattle registry. So uh, the farmer can upload a cattle and the breeding cycle is digitized so as to take input and send regular real-time alerts. So uh, we guide them on what is the right time to inseminate, what is the right time, uh, what is the time for vaccination, for diseases, breeding, heat, calving, all the critical milestones happening in a cattle's life. Uh, we help them uh, analyze that data as well as capture them in one registry in, in, in a, a timeline. So this data also um, helps uh, other stakeholders, governments, and us to take real-time decisions. So which area the milk production is more? Uh, what are they spending more on uh, their cost? Or even, for example, to take an action, where uh, uh, is the milking cattle more versus calf uh, uh, count more? Um, which farmer or village or district or state level has more pregnancy cattle so that they need special care. So all the decision making can be taken out from the analytics that are captured via the app and analyzed by us. Um, looking at the data where cattle are managed, one of the key areas that we uh, uh, focused on and we uh, realized that is one bigger pain point for the farmers is again cattle health and kind of uh, also, the gap increased during the COVID time because we've realized that already the food system, especially the dairy ecosystem, wasn't resilient enough and it kind of broke. That is where during the pandemic, when India was in complete lockdown for three months, we realized that veterinarians who are supposed to be like these godly for farmers couldn't reach the farmers on time. And we started this toll-free number to provide them with uh, uh, still uh, qualified veterinary access. We had 5,000 plus calls received within, within three months. And again, what we were assuming, 75% of the calls were related to cattle health. Uh, that turned us, and what Mariana was also talking about, the pivot that usually happens and the, the innovative technology that you need to capture too is why not uh, create a platform wherein farmers collect, connect with qualified veterinarians uh, and the tool that they were most comfortable in was WhatsApp. So using like a WhatsApp interface, uh, we created an e-Dairy Mitra on the, uh, uh, on the platform, on the mobile application, wherein the farmers can send voice note, text, image, connect via video call with qualified uh, veterinarians and get their uh, problems resolved. Because we also realized 70 to 80 percent of the problems can be solved virtually because the, there are these 10 broad 10 categories that the farmers always face challenge on. And the data uh, captured could be analyzed that which area again to, to uh, from the farmer to the state level, which area has which diseases and how do we actually help them solve their challenge. Um, the third also interesting element that came from uh, COVID as well as the need to innovate in the COVID times was the need for uh, information and knowledge. So uh, smallholder dairy farmers usually used to, they used to meet, they used to meet to other uh, dairy farmers or, you know, the company agents used to come. There used to be government agents running on the ground. Uh, there used to be mailers and fairs telling them about, you know, uh, sharing more information and knowledge, which kind of completely stopped. But there need. This is where you need to innovate because the the information and knowledge still needs to reach to the farmer, and that is where we created a community platform initially using uh, Facebook because that is widely used by farmers in India, wherein we created a platform to share uh, knowledge, e-learning videos, uh, vet uh, bringing veterinarians and government officials on board for expert interviews, talking to them about the current schemes, uh, loans, subsidies, uh, sharing other dairy farmer stories so that they, you know, find influential farmers that they can uh, learn from. So all of this uh, bridging the gap of information and knowledge as well. So these were the three broad areas uh, that we, uh, uh, you know, tackled during the COVID time. And we felt like uh, that is one bridge uh, that needs to be covered if we want to build a resilient uh, food and dairy ecosystem. And uh, in the end, I just want to leave you guys with, with the, my favorite stats so far uh, and why I am focusing on dairy and India. Because while I'm talking about big numbers in the Indian dairy industry, there, there are news that you know milk uh, is uh, superseding uh, meat as a primary source of animal protein with the love for dairy products always increasing and uh, assuming to increase in the next 10 years. But 
at the same time we have this you know report by uh, on the global uh, 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 nutrition that we still have uh, 20% 24% of the world's malnourished and 30% of the stunted children under 5 so there is this huge a gap that is yet to be fulfilled so a lot of work needs to happen in the dairy industry uh, you know for us to build a sustainable nutritional nutritious and efficient dairy ecosystem so yeah thank you thank you so much ashna that's 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 uh, that's really interesting i i i i definitely learned a few a few new things uh, <laughs> after that presentation um i mean you just really showed how important um it is to develop this this uh, this sector um, and also to that it grows and develops in a sustainable and transparent transparent way. Um, I was very interested in what you were saying about um, needing more information. Um, it was more information and, and training, did you say, or the knowledge? Yeah, the knowledge absolutely. So, and I guess what I what I'm what I'm interested to know is, I mean, uh, you're talking about information and knowledge for the farmers, and are you also talking about from your perspective as well of getting more information and knowledge from the farmers? Uh, it's both actually, uh, Mariana, because one to the farmers for sure, because what we felt was during COVID, they were in terms of information, they were isolated. Right. So, you know, uh, not uh, so there, there used to be a lot of uh, fairs happening where you would see all the companies and the governments coming together that we don't see happening for the next one year, you know, where you see 100,000 uh, farmers and in, in one playground or in a university. We don't see that happening in the coming future. So uh, you and there were you know, uh, uh, government had their agents or their method to how do they actually reach the last mile to tell them about, okay, this is the new scheme that we are going to run. So where we saw this gap in information and very honestly, we were always thinking about this community platform, but much farther in our, let's say, product roadmap. You know, we were thinking it, okay, let's, let's do this, this, and this is how, you know, this probably will do next year. So this is how you need to realize that how you need to pivot and completely, you know, change your strategy, looking at the conditions and what your farmer or your customer needs from you. And when we started, you know, because we have an on-ground workforce and we work very closely with the farmers, um, we realized from the information coming from them that you're talking about, that there is this huge gap. And this is where they felt uh, this, this isolation that we felt that we need to come in. And because, uh, you know, there needs to be, we need one platform wherein government can give information, milk companies can say, okay, what is the new products they're bringing? Have they led to any subsidies? Are they increasing prices? Uh, could we bring in more, you know, banks to talk about uh, their loan policies that they have developed during this, this time? So you need one platform wherein the farmer can come and get access to knowledge and information from various stakeholders. And let's not forget one major uh, um, a source of knowledge is the other farmers always you know you learn they learn from each other and that is how smallholder farmers work they, they that's uh, it's very influential the, the influential marketing really works because they are seeing someone who has 40 cows who has done you know taken certain decisions and changed and let their dairy into profit so they want to learn but with with the complete lockdown for three months that is where they suffered right so I think learning from them uh, to understand their need and also then uh, giving them what they want is, is the where the bridge happens. So I guess what, what I'm curious to know is that um, in light of this pandemic, did the nature and the quality of, of data that you were receiving from the farmers, did that change? Um, and also did the pandemic reveal gaps that you didn't know existed previously and not just i'm not just talking about gaps that are a result of the pandemic but maybe did it reveal some information and knowledge gaps uh that you didn't know existed before this pandemic um uh, uh, so i feel like um uh, again the importance of veterinarian really came out you know like um uh, we always felt that you know they still have a lot of access to, you know, uh, uh, 
para veterinarians or people in their village that take care of this thing but the the gap of the uh, uh, expert or let me say qualified veterinarians came out uh, more clearer than ever right because like government makes sure that they you know deploy only the qualified with the degree veterinarians on ground but there are a lot of private practi- practitioners that just go you know maybe a compounder who has one month of uh, training and in in a, in a hospital but he's not he's not allowed or legally allowed to give any prescription they were the ones who were filling these gaps earlier you know filling these gaps are okay if there's no qualified veterinarian there'll be this this person who we actually call quack it's called quackery so quackery really existed in the indian veterinary ecosystem right so that came out very transparent when they couldn't reach also and that's when when we realized that the need for qualified uh, services how important is that you know and uh, that was one of the uh, major revelations that came out uh, uh um, you know much more clearer here that that is where we need to focus on because those quacks are probably not the, the i mean they are there with you uh, in terms of speed and time but not in terms of quality mm. and this is an asset that you're dealing with you're dealing with actually this is not just a cow it's farmers uh, it's cash flow it's 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 his asset so you can't just play with it you need quality as well and not just time so mm. that was one mm. interesting element that came out So just going back again to the importance of the dairy sector for the future of uh n- nutrition in India. Um so it, you you said that um farmers can build their uh cattle's health history through Moo Farms digital platform. Is that is that correct? Yes, so yeah. they can so, maintain their records and now with the veterinarians mm. so every prescription will be added to a cattle timeline mm. automatically so, by the veterinarian. So obviously that brings like a new level of transparency um to this act can be for and so both parties can see like antibiotics that have been prescribed prior health concerns etc so how has how has this digital aspect changed um veterinarians and farmers ability to keep their records and what kind of impact do you think this this transparency and and these you know robust uh mm. records will have on the on the sector uh absolutely great uh, uh, um uh, effects to mariana because not just for farmers uh definitely for farmers because the more record they give the more analysis that they get right so you know they they, they exactly know that uh, if they are uh, showing their cattle to a veterinarian the veterinarian can see the past record that oh three months back your cattle actually suffered from this and this why has it repeated otherwise they have no history or background but a lot of data points for example if they start maintaining the semen uh, 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 record like the, the straw that they if they have that there's a lot of uh, uh, you know f- uh, uh, you a fake semen that is going around uh, the the synthetic one so that could be tackled at a much much bigger scale um for the, the data for the pharmaceutical industries is going to be so relevant when they see that okay which antibiotic was prescribed which resulted into whether an increase in milk or a quality so a lot of a- analysis not just for farmers but for other stakeholders involved as well it's going to be so easy for them to get uh, pre approval for a loan you know when they have their registry of again asset they are a business owner you know they have their record keeping of their farm as well as cattle a pre approval loan or even for getting the cattle insured if you have a health history with you with with each cattle's record tagged to the number or you know the world bank award we won for facial recognition so you can't even tamper no can tamper with your uh, record so there insurance companies the currently one of the biggest problem is uh, trust between the insurance companies and the farmers so when that is full you know there's more transparent and it's more reliable then uh, the, the the time the stats that i'm telling you about just percent of the cattle insured out of 300 million that's going to increase because you have the data to back up uh, you know and buy an insurance policy so mm. multiple aspects to different stakeholders thank you so much um so i just have one one final question and of course um any any uh audience members please shoot through any questions at any time um so uh 
I have a statistic here that says that there's an estimated 90% of the animal husbandry work is done by women. So, Absolutely. <laughs> so I guess I'm, I, I'm interested to know what are some of the approaches that you use to make Move Farm and its services particularly accessible and beneficial to uh, women dairy farmers? So uh, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know how I missed this in my presentation before because we were focusing on data, but absolutely bang on because they are the backbones of dairy. And this is why we started uh, Move Farm in the first place because we were always sure that we wanted to uh, do something for the farmers and women empowerment. And that's where we realized dairy is one sector where, you know, majority work is being done by women. So, uh, you know, we, we've tied up with um, uh, uh, an agency called Internet Sathi, which is um, a, a joint venture between Google and Tata Trust. And they have their uh, women uh, agents on ground. So they are these internet agents who go on, uh, you know, the agents that Stephanie was also talking about. They are the ones dealing with farmers and, you know, further training them on digital literacy. So we, we tied up with them on how they could mobilize more women and teach them about, you know, the e-learning the e videos and the practices and the application we talk. Um, also, uh, you know, when we were starting in, in the beginning, we realized that uh, uh, that what usually government ends up or people end is set up village level camps but because of a lot of uh, traditional and social restrictions happening in the village level in, in India women sometimes are not asked to you know sit at, in the same place uh, at an assembly for uh, you know along with men so what we started doing was instead of stopping at village level camps we went door to door so we had these agents on ground who would actually go from door to door and make sure that they get the women outside and teach them about the application or the critical practices that we talk about in the dairy. Because um, with just camps, we saw very less attendance. And now, you know, the community platform we are talk uh, I to told you about, there's going to be a special uh, section in that called Her Dairy. So very focused content information and, uh, you know, uh, knowledge uh, responsible and, uh, you know, needed for women farmers would be there. So we do keep in mind uh, in every aspect, you know, uh, where the, the information actually reaches the one who's actually going to take, take care of the cattle, which are women. That's great. Look, I, I just, I had uh, one question come through uh, from an audience member. So we'll, we'll, we'll uh, take care of this one and then we're going to move on to uh, Shahid's sure. presen presentation. Um, so this is from uh, Irene Wa Wagak Wa Wagaki. Um, uh, so she, she says she runs a dairy enterprise optimization digital product in Kenya and she's interested in reaching out to you for potential co collaboration to discuss ideas. So, uh, Irene, I guess, uh, you, you wouldn't mind, um, uh, you could share my email address, but yeah. does it, you can also probably fill it in on the, in the Excel document if any of the other, um, audience members would like to, to get in touch with you. Um, but she Perfect. particularly wants to know, um, so uh, as she says, another function of dairy productivity is quality and affordable feeds. What strategies do you have around that? And she's also interested to know and how you deal with low connectivity areas. So if you can share any insights um, around that issue. Okay, so uh, so the low connectivity area. So when we started uh, the e dairy Mitra, the the connect that we're talking to you about, um, we realized that we, with just the e calls, like you know the WhatsApp based audio or video calls, may not work. So what we did was we tied up with uh, a, a solution provider and included network call in the application itself. So the calls that they have to make with the the uh, veterinarians need not be via internet because most of the time that's one uh, you know a lot of times in certain areas of india as well there is that issue so you could still uh, not use the internet call feature if you don't have internet coverage but use a regular uh, network coverage as well and uh, that's that we the change that we added on after realizing the technical issues as well uh, in terms of uh, the, the the feed that she the question um, Irene was talking about, yes. So currently we are focusing on um, you know provided providing them with the knowledge uh, to you know what is the exactly for for each cattle's milk output, what should be the nutrition that 
out that means uh, you know the ration balancing program that a uh, government of india also has you know the right uh, uh, the quantity of uh, dry feed and green fodder and we also give them a lot of tips and uh, video content on how to make their own silage you know green fodder uh, silage at home and stuff but um, very soon probably in the next 6 months we are also bringing uh, e-commerce on the platform wherein the farmers uh, we would be you know making sure Sure that we get uh, uh, the the feed uh, mineral mixture packets and everything uh, in bulk, and we give them at a lower cost through our e-commerce portal within the application. So, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much, Ashna. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to the next panelist. Uh, next panelist now. Um, so, Shahid Akbar, he's the founder and CEO of the Bangladesh Institute of ICT and Development. Um, So they they are fostering ICT integration in development initiatives and mainstreaming ICT for D. Uh, he leads various e agriculture projects under the umbrella of e Krishok, on nutrition and entrepreneurship development programs for micro and small um, businesses with a focus on women and youth. So uh, B I I D initiatives envision and align to achieve SDGs and national development goals. Um Shahid thank you so much for joining us today um I'll let you let you take it away Thank you Ayana thank you very much and thank you for inviting me in this session I'll be briefly present uh, uh, what exactly we are doing and uh, a very quick one uh, relevant to the uh, covid situation so I think you can see my slides uh, So basically, this is an uh, I I always like the smiles of the farmers, and uh, so the, he is one of uh, the very uh, popular one. Like uh, he adopts uh, new technologies, and uh, there is a quote of um, our prime minister in Bangla. Uh, he said that uh, she was pursuing that uh, even after the COVID, when people are talking about um, uh, the, the crisis and when the lockdown starts, people went for food. Uh, collection, not for any expensive item. So those type of things are happening, and then these farmers are the key of this whole thing. So we are talking about the uh, little uh, smart solution and digital services, so that the aid management can be more efficient, and uh, the disaster recovery also support in the agriculture sector can be done uh, smartly. So uh, I will share a little bit about what we are doing. Uh, we have couple of initiatives. I will not. Uh, Go through this uh, as already you shared. Uh, we have uh, three focus area. One is agriculture, another is on, on nutrition, and third one is the entrepreneurship. And we work with the different agencies uh, from government to private sector, international development agencies to, to the uh, academia. So yep, uh, they are our partners. So I will share you one quick thing. Like uh, we have an app uh, called uh, again Ecoshock that is our flagship thing. In fact, uh, we understood that. Um, For based on our last uh, many a couple uh, few years experience that uh, farmers have uh, limited access to information on extension and th it goes like uh, uh, they don't have much uh, access in terms of uh, price information in terms of weather alert and those things so we introduced a solution which was unfortunately this is also in bangla <laughs> so the you you can see here all the text are in bangla so in, in these apps there are couple of other things also uh since we also found that uh, the farmers don't run their farms as a business so we try to focus them so, so that they can operate like a uh, business house so there's a business planning solution also here very simple business plan canvas then they can also calculate their profit so that uh, they understand that okay if i do this crop then what will be my crop profit and if i don't uh, uh, make some comparison that also can be done and then uh we uh, we found that uh, some crops are very sensitive to the rain and uh, weather like uh, moong bean moong bean is uh, one of the very in interesting crop uh, in southern belt of bangladesh but uh, most of the farmers suffer when uh, the rain comes and uh, they don't have any alert so we try to give uh, them some alert uh, system through this uh, um, uh, mobile apps as well as ibr system so and also there is an agronomy information bank uh, through which they can farmers can avail the agronomy information so after having all these things we realized that uh, after the covid came and the government decided to support the farmers but when they wanted to uh, recognize that okay who need what type of support then they 
struggle that okay they, they don't have enough data that okay how do i assess the farmers loss or what is the uh, actual status of the farmers and at this point of time so we in this um, application through which your uh, farmers uh, digital profile development as well as geo mapping thing uh, so this is an uh, so that uh, the government can help out uh, the, uh, the the farmers and the farms uh, to make sure that uh, they get an a good type of information and the value chain is properly um, measured through our efficient service as well as uh, our business information and other services so it's like an uh, uh, we wanted to support farmers as well as with, uh, to the relevant organizations like the Ministry of Agriculture. So through this uh, uh, um, service, we are offering that, that the farmers have been profiled and they, we also can see that, okay, the farm, how much uh, land the farmers are using. And what we also understood that uh, in some areas, the farmers are not really using maximum of their land uses. So we wanted uh, to map that and then also uh, we wanted to see the what is the production loss they have uh, incurred during the COVID and also what type of services already they are availing. So yes, that they have already some uh, credit from the NGOs and now uh, they whether they are eligible for grant or an investment. So also we looked into the non-financial training marketing and also some uh, share or co-working space and mentoring uh, uh, the uh, small businesses who have been doing and also the definitely the monitoring kind of thing. So when we started this discussion with the Ministry of Agriculture, we also find that, okay, not only the Ministry of Agriculture, but some other organizations, they also need this thing. Because everybody needs a decision-making system. So now the BRTB, the, the other local government agencies, uh, the central bank, financial institution, uh, even ICT division, they are now uh, joining us in this uh, venture. And also some of the uh, development agencies, they do see that, okay, yes, this is an interesting platform, so they can use it. So this online platform basically is an, uh, any farmer can enroll by uh, themselves and uh, they can, uh, if they tag the geotagging, uh, so we can identify their locations and they can do, or they can uh, uh, do their own assessment that, okay, this is what I have. And then automatically the application will support them, whether they are, potential or whether they have the eligibility to repair the loan because we are talking more about the credit system which has been uh, uh, in, as an incentive that the government is offering and then the notification things uh, monitoring very basic kind of uh, facilities we are offering and then it, it will help the, uh, the government agencies as well as the banks to get a data driven system like uh, they can see that okay in this particular location we found that okay, Southern Belt is uh, more vulnerable so that uh, they can take a decision. But uh, yeah, and also it is an, uh, we want to make this system very inclusive and open data approach so that uh, uh, our partners can access to this data and uh, they can avail these things. And also we are doing some credit scoring because I'm sure you have heard of Bangladesh is very famous for the microfinancing, but uh, sometimes I feel uh, that is a uh, problem for the farmers. So we want to score the farmer what is the status of their multiple uh, credit uh, facilities and, and how they can repay those kind of things. So basically this is the structure. I don't want to do this uh, because it's a little bit uh, how the flow works uh, and it's in cloud-based data and uh, it's well connected with everybody, especially the field staff as well as the government itself. So uh, we have been uh, supporting the government for uh, this type of uh, apps and solutions and uh, the farmers uh, uh, are also can uh, phone call or in fact avail the services from us so the, uh, that is the services but also since we are a for profit organization we also look at look at the business model that how really uh, it will sustain even after the government support is over so we developed a business model for this uh, if we have a database of 250 100,000 profile then we can make some business and also uh, we have some uh, financial uh, organizations who are supporting like some credit facilities. So if it's a thousand million credit portfolio, then yeah, we can really get uh, make some money out of it. And definitely it's a win-win situation for everybody. And our uh, revenue comes from the service charge, the management fees and the solution fee. So that's all basically from my side. And uh, if you have any question, I will be happy to share. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ahid. 
Um, of course, uh, again, uh, attendees are welcome to submit their questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of their screens. Um, so first, uh, I, I guess, of course, like with all the other panelists, I would love to hear how, um, the, how COVID and the pandemic caused you to pivot. What were, what, were, what were the biggest pivots that you found to react to, um, to this pandemic? Uh, basically, uh, in fact, um, sometimes everybody when talk about the COVID's uh, negative things, I uh, do some devil's advocacy that uh, these days people understand the value of ICT. Now people talk about ICT, particularly when we started this thing long back in 2008, and we tried to convince people that, okay, uh, ICT and internet can help the farmers, people give a uh, smile that, okay, what are you talking about, uh, internet and all these high-tech solutions for the farmers. But this time when COVID started and uh, people have the restrictions to go out, extension, extension service was really, really struggling to serve the farmers. So at that time, in fact, uh, this type of solution uh, really triggered the whole uh, system. And uh, in Bangladesh, we have like a, once uh, a assist, some assistant agriculture officer who offered the service to the farmers at the field level, uh, they have to cover like 2,500 farmers uh, uh, per month, so which is physically impossible. And humanly, uh, it's not a doable thing. So this type of solutions and uh, Particularly, this COVID situation proved that yes, uh, you don't need to go visit every day to every farmer. Rather, if you have a system and which can enable you to make sure that okay, at least you have some services. But the challenge also we felt like uh, we talk about the smartphones and all these applications. But the challenge was like um, not every farmer has the uh, access to the smartphone, and uh, they don't understand about these apps and everything. So what we did basically, we have an idea solution also, so that. Uh, Farmers can get uh, information by just dialing a number. And also we have the push services so that uh, automatically if you are subscribed or uh, if you are within any project, then uh, they can avail this facility. So COVID uh, like an uh, flag raising thing that uh, extension service can be disseminated through uh, internet and uh, ICT based platforms. Thank you. Uh, one of our uh, speakers had a had a great uh, introduction for his for his uh, presentation, and uh, he had a, a little a little question. Who it was? Uh, who led the digital transformation of your company? Option A, the CEO. Option B, uh, the CTO. And option C, COVID nineteen. And it's very <laughs> it's very true also of the of the agriculture sector because. Um, this is really one thing that, I mean, I'm sure all of you panelists can agree, you know, there's a lot of criticism about um, actually, you know, for farmers to actually adopt these, these digital uh, innovations. And um, that, that is one positive from this is that there has been a, a big cultural, not just a cultural shift, but I guess it, because of necessity, right? So, um, so yeah, it is very interesting that, that you do point that out. There are some positives, obviously, to all of this, <laughs> all of these uh, negative impacts also. Um, so, uh, uh, Shahid, I also, I just wanted to, to ask a little bit about, um, about the data collection that you mentioned also, because um, one of the other big topics is, um, you know, when we talk about data privacy. So, um, what actions are being taken to protect farmers data privacy throughout this process of data collection to generating these reports? Basically, uh, number one is um, uh, we are not collecting too much information which they don't want to share. Rather, we are giving an option that, okay, what type of uh, support you need and uh, we definitely uh, have that uh, all these uh, standard uh, protocols to make sure that, okay, data is uh, well secured as well as uh, the consent thing from the farmers because uh, while uh, processing any kind of uh, application, we need a lot of uh, data in terms of uh, financial data particularly. Uh, so uh, we are very, very uh, careful about uh, whom we are sharing the data. And uh, so we have partnerships uh, with organizations so that they don't disclose this data and we never use this thing for the commercial purposes. So uh, we are trying to make sure that uh, this data is not uh, being uh, used for any other purposes. So yeah, data protection is uh, definitely still, uh, we don't have a magic bullet for um, making sure that uh, uh, this thing, uh, data protection uh, is uh, 
uh, really really taken care because the, the experience we have which are not very good or very exciting that uh, we can assure 100 percent but uh, we are taking care of our farmers uh, that uh, okay they are safe and uh, we don't uh, disclose in a, a, any public uh, forums or platforms it's only for the close groups uh, kind of users thanks i have uh, one final question and then and then uh, we'll move on to the to the next panelist um, so this digital process you've outlined for assessing loss and aiding beneficiaries has points of intersection with digital finance. Can you talk more about the importance of integrating digital finance components and how this can improve farmers' resilience in the long term? Uh, this is the more crucial thing. I, I felt like uh, the farmers, um, uh, that this digitization process makes uh, life easier. Uh, because it's more efficient and more quick uh, because most of the cases what we find uh, not like the only COVID but uh, since in Bangladesh we face a lot of natural uh, disasters especially now the floods are going on and if you don't provide the support in time and uh, the, uh, if the financing doesn't go uh, to the right farmers that is the biggest uh, um, challenge uh, we, have, we have been facing for last, last many years. So this platform is opening up the opportunity that okay uh, the banks are there uh, the organizations are there, the farmers are there. So they are well connected and it's all about a click kind of thing. If the government decides that, okay, yes, I want to support this group, they can have a, a quick analysis and they can go for this uh, quick uh, financial uh, mechanism. Like uh, we have some digital platforms like Vikash and uh, other DBVL solutions, uh, which allow farmers, everybody has an account now. So it, it's not a formal banking account, but they have a digital uh, wallet kind of thing. So it's much easier than any time. So we feel that uh, this is a kind of profiling, if you connect with the uh, mobile operators, uh, then it will be more easier to reach anybody and everybody. I have one more question from, from an audience member. Irene asks, how does your model commercialize farmer data? Um, and are you sending farmer profiles to lenders? Uh, it's not a lender still we are not, uh, we are not uh, providing the data in fact we are working with the government and uh, some agencies so it's like an uh, the data only comes through when they are willing to provide the data for a particular um, uh, scheme there are some incentive schemes and uh, COVID, uh, particularly for the COVID one so we share the only few data and once they scrutinize and then we provide the full data to the government only not to any other private agencies uh, because uh, the money goes through the private uh, banks but uh, the analysis done by the government first that okay we selected this uh, mr abcd and then they, these are the amounts and you just distribute uh, so the it goes not to the lender rather it goes to the government thank you thank you so much Aid. um so we're going to move on to the final panelist um zaituna mustafa um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Zaituna is a market engagement manager for the GSMA Agritech program. Within GSMA, she advises mobile operators on development and implementation of mobile money strategy, robust business plans and operational plans to digitize agricultural value chains. Her expertise is digital financial services with experience in digital finance strategic um, <laughs> Sorry, strategic and operational aspects for mobile money providers and financial institutions. Uh, Zaituna, thank you so much for joining us today, and and uh, I'll let you I'll let you take it away. Thank you. I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Excellent. Um, so my name is Zaituna. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. From wherever you are. Um, yeah, I'll just take about five minutes to wrap up, I think, what uh, the rest of uh, the great panelists have already said. Um, but, I, but I'll just start with uh, um, just reflecting about the, the theme, you know, for us uh, being an intersection between uh, the implementers, that's uh, the agritechs, and uh, the donors, that's DFID, um, the GSMA agritech, we look at uh, best practices that we are seeing at this time uh, for COVID-19 and of course, um, forecast what can be seen afterwards. So my, my theme, I, I had to now uh, lean it to what we'll speak about today. So for me, I'll, I'll just touch on how some agritechs repurpose their existing digital solutions to respond to COVID-19. Um, and um, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll start by the, by the famous Charles Dickens in his book, uh, The Tale of Two Cities. Uh, it was the best times, it was the worst times. Um, I'll not uh, do the whole, um, it's a mouthful um, quote, but what uh, this already tells me from my reflection is, whilst it's the, uh, the year has been the worst in terms of people uh, having anxiety, economic failings, you know, um, the pandemic has also brought a bit of uncertainty, even in the agricultural sector. Um, it has also provided an opportunity for digital tools as we adapt to the new normal. Um, one famous um, uh, speaker at our just concluded uh, GSMA Thrive China uh, just said that the COVID-19 has not changed our thinking. It has accelerated our thinking. And, and I think I, I go home with, with that and uh, my few slides will just reflect on what some agritechs have done around that. Uh, yeah, so basically four challenges come out uh, from um, having looked at uh, COVID-19 since March to now, uh, there are four challenges that even face the agricultural sector in terms of restrictions of movement, you know, the social distancing measures that has been put by different governments, the curfews, you know, like my, my country here in Kenya, we have curfews every other uh, seven o'clock to 4 a.m. in the morning. So uh, business times are shorter. And then business closures as well, you know, the institutional uh, businesses, hotels, hospitality industry, schools, and so forth. So all the four have uh, some effects on the agricultural sector, especially because uh, movements of food, movements of inputs, and uh, even movement of people, just uh, what um, uh, answer said around the veterinary uh, uh, doctors who actually go and uh, treat um, the, 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 the cattle. So it has, yes, it has its own challenges, but it has also created uh, gaps that um, agritechs are feeling or digital platforms are feeling. For example, the first one, what has happened is um, uh, players had to come in and uh, present um, solutions that are able to virtually um, meet those gaps. Uh, for example, extension services is now done virtually, you know. Um, we just uh, heard from ANSA again around even the veterinary now being done via WhatsApp and so forth. In terms of social distancing, what has it done? Uh, it has presented opportunities around use of also digital tools in e-commerce. We've seen three to five folds of um, demand uh, on e-commerce platforms. And we've also seen digitization of communication and extension services to farmers, um, even over and above what they normally do around best practices in agri-tech agri and agriculture. It's even going more to sanitation. I think um, Stephanie spoke about that uh, in her presentation. We are also seeing around the curfews, uh, what is happening is it's, it's reducing the time for farmers uh, selling their goods or even their supplies. However, we've also seen uh, from our interviews that we are collecting right now too, to actually uh, produce a big piece uh, of research on, on, on this matter. Uh, whereby farmers are now using some of their time to invest in other in, uh, businesses or, or learning new skills. It's, it's just the same as what we also do. Uh, I mean, this is when we are seeing ourselves even learning new skills and um, um, engaging in different, um, different skills that we've been postponing for, for some time maybe. In terms of business closures, um, yes, it, there are some impacts around uh, B2B, what we call business to business uh, transactions because demand has gone down. Uh, we've seen that with hotels and institutions like schools being closed, um, uh, customers now um, most uh, digital platforms have to now do what they call B2C, so business to consumers because everyone is in lockdown and they are, they are uh, ordering uh, online. Um, so I have three, I took three um, agritechs who are doing something interesting around the COVID-19 in terms of repurposing uh, their existing uh, digital platforms. One is um, an agritech in Indonesia. So Yala in Indonesia was uh, predominantly known for um, uh, being a shrimp epidemiology app to help farmers take their shrimp directly to market. However, what, what it was initially built for was uh, to literally uh, test the water quality levels uh, to reduce uh, shrimp, uh, you know. 
So it was predominantly made for that. But with the pandemic, um, they saw how their farmers were being affected in terms of um, their demand to um, exporting to Japan. You know, the USA was literally uh, came to a halt overnight. You know, and with that, with no lack of um, no actually uh, storage facilities, um, these farmers were literally selling at a throwaway price to middlemen because uh, the, the margins, you know, the margins are now lower and they still need to have some few margins for, for them to survive. And what this now Agritech had to do is uh, to um, build a new feature inside, inside this app and ensure that farmers are able to um, sell um, directly to the, to the consumers in Indonesian market. That is the east of Java. And, and you just see from overnight, or rather in the two weeks uh, since the COVID hit Indonesia, um, Yala purchased around one to, one to two tons per week directly from farmers, uh, around 200 of them, you know. So this is one way we see, we are seeing an agritech who, which is repurposing its uh, digital tools to meet the the, the current um, issue at hand. Um, another one is um, it's a mobile based uh, agritech in Uganda called Omulimisa. So Omulimisa was literally built for uh, mobile based extension services uh, to farmers, smallholder farmers in uh, Uganda. However, with COVID nineteen um, and having information gap around even the safety sanitation features um, and, and farmers being one of the most vulnerable and rural communities, uh, they were able to repurpose their platforms to actually um, meet the WHO health advisory to these, to these farmers in local languages via SMSs. So, and they had to do this free of charge to adapt to the new normal and, and just ensure that these farmers were able to uh, literally be, uh, be getting the right information and factual ones as, as well. Another um, um, case study that I took and, and, and the reason why I took it is uh, now we are going, uh, we are taking the bus to West Africa. Um, this is in Ghana. So there is an agri-tech in Ghana that leverages information service, still doing uh, more of uh, a communication to the farmers, but um, um, doing it through voice, you know, IVR and so forth. So initially they were developed for, uh, to provide weather market and agronomic updates, uh, what we call the information advisory uh, to, to their farmers. However, with COVID-19, they saw a gap and uh, the gap was uh, these farmers are not able to um, um, have the right information around sanitation and COVID-19 related information. So to their 18,000 uh, smallholder farmers, they were able to um, make sure that uh, this information that is English, in English, uh, was uh, literally translated to seven local languages in Ghana. And uh, up to now, they've reached uh, around 67,000 um, minutes of, uh, of those voice messages. So basically, uh, in a nutshell, what we are trying to say is, uh, um, and I'll go back to my quote again uh, that, that, that was said by the famous uh, speaker at GSMA Thrive is, it has not changed our thinking, it has just accelerated. We already had the platforms, we just needed to repurpose it. And I can go on and on, uh, but uh, um, I, I know my colleague uh, in the fourth, third series had already talked about um, how um, e-commerce platforms have also been repurposed uh, to literally uh, uh, make sure that people get food in the house now that the lockdown is something real, the curfews are real, and, and so forth. So without taking much of your time, I, I can take questions. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saituna. So interesting. I, I really appreciated how you went through each of the of the different in, in interventions and, and looked at how how they how each of them then changed to to adapt. Um, so uh, I mean, I, I want to talk a little bit about some of the trends that you've seen in their access to the mar to markets as well. So um, have you been able to observe any trends based on farmers location, age, gender? what they produce, access to SMS or any of the other, um, you know, methods to communicate with them, internet, et cetera. Excellent. I think, uh, um, you know, even, even if COVID-19 has, uh, has, did not give us any warning, you know, when it, when it landed. So many agri-techs are still also repurposing even the investments, you know, with the
Okay. Ah, you, 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 um, you disconnected for a moment. I'm, I'm so sorry. Would you be able to restart answering that question? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Excellent. Uh, so I, I was just reiterating that um, COVID-19 came and it didn't, it didn't give anyone any warning, you know. And with Agritech, they still had to repurpose also their investment for investments to, to start meeting the new demands. So the trends we've seen, I think, around market linkages are um, Agritech platforms like Trigger Foods partnering with uh, big giants like Jumia in, in, in Kenya to, to start delivering at home, you know. We've seen um, Agritech like Farm Crowdy that has, uh, was only for crowdsourcing. Now they have an e-commerce. Um, so for, for communication, I think I've already shared the, the, the two interesting um, case study. That's Farm Align and Omulimisa. And yeah, so, so for us, I think uh, we are already seeing um, small, small changes, but uh, it cannot happen overnight. Uh, I think they, they still need investments. So even our call to action, and we are actually producing uh, another blog around e-commerce, delving deep into e-commerce. I've shared our first blog on COVID-19 on the chat. What we are saying is uh, we need more investment, short-term, medium, and long-term investments from funders to start building and uh, more robust solutions. You know, the agri-tech still need that capex and that opex. But market linkages, I think for me is, um, is something that uh, can be looked at uh, with investments. Yeah, I, 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 I was very interested to see um, uh, the results of, of uh, is, it, is it Jala? Is that the right pronunciation? Yala, yes, J Yala. Uh, Yala, Yala, sorry. Um, so were, were, uh, was, this, was, Yala, was Yala, was it facilitating um, farmers' access, I guess, to local markets because they, because of the transportation problems. Can you go, yes. go in a little bit more detail? Thus they, so they were, did it open up new uh, markets locally? Or? Yes. Okay. I, I, I can give a bit of, um, yeah, a bit of, so what the shrimp market, was, the biggest expo exporters of shrimp market was Japan and USA. With the international borders uh, closed and restrictions of uh, flights and all, all that, um, these farmers literally had, you know, all, all the shrimps, uh, they had to sell it to the local market, but they didn't have uh, enough local um, cold storage because this is, uh, they, they, they had to have robust uh, cold storage, which is actually one of the needs that we are already identifying in our, in our, in our research that, that is coming up in uh, soon. So for, for us, um, what Yala did was interesting because they were able to repurpose, you know, they, their, their work. They were only um, there for this, what we call the reduction of the water supply for shrimp in terms of uh, reducing shrimp diseases. However, they repurposed to connect now the farmers to local markets. That's the Indonesian um, population. And, and, and it's, it's in, in that way, uh, if you see this, uh, this slide, that they were able to sell to, um, to, 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 to local markets and connect 200 farmers to the local markets. It, it's, it's really interesting to see that how um, new markets have opened and um, because of this as well. Um, so I, I guess I'm interested to know, um, you know, with GSMA's work, like, like, like this, recording some of these, um, these pivots. What are what are? Do you have any big picture predictions for future changes in market engagements? You know, as you mm -hmm. know, for example, like like this, like this. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think big picture prediction for sure. Um, I think the the role of uh, mobile and the role of digital has been seen. Um, I, I normally say I I like using the example of Empresa uh, back in the day where. The, the external stimuli was um, unfortunately uh, the, the post-election violence in, in Kenya. And it literally pushed the product, you know, and people who had not uh, tried it, tried it and they saw the, the benefits. And COVID-19 is playing an external stimuli like that. So with that as GSMA uh, seated uh, at the intersection, what we already see is with the right investments and the right models, we are able to now feel 
some of the gaps in digital agriculture in terms of digital finance, market, uh, market linkages, uh, extension services, what we call advisory, digitizing advisory. So those are some of the trends we already see e-commerce uh, uh, starting to play and uh, an important role uh, now and going forward. Thank you so much, Aituna. Um, as we have no more questions coming in from the audience at this time, uh, I want to quickly pose a final question to each of the panelists before we sign off today. Um, and, and, and that is, I'll, I'll get each of you to answer. Maybe we'll start with, with Stephanie, uh, seeing as you were the first panelist. Um, I want to ask if, if each of you can identify one key change that, that you see needs to happen um, in order for us to build or to rebuild a more resilient global food system in light of this pandemic. And also, if you like, um, an opportunity that you think has been the most surprising or the most important opportunity that the pandemic has revealed. Um, Stephanie, if you want, you can, you can give your insight here. Yep. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think mindset has a very um, important role. Um, yeah, I, I think with, uh, you know, uh, whether it's, it's COVID-19 or, you know, in, in, in terms of a crisis, um, the, the mindset of, of different people needs to kind of shift in order to see what the opportunities are, are there. Um, so there could be, you know, a, a variety of digital tools, platforms that are available, but if the mindset is kind of focused on what used to work before, then it doesn't, um, it doesn't help build uh, that resiliency, um, not even, uh, not just sort of the smallholder level, but also if you kind of move towards different stakeholders. So the mindset of, of, of different stakeholders really need to maybe shift. I wouldn't say change, maybe shift a bit, but to be more open-minded on the possibilities that um, are other solutions that, that can help um, build their resilience, especially in uncertain times. Thank you, Stephanie. Ashna, if you have your insight, we'd love to hear it. Yeah, so uh, Mariana, uh, COVID-19 has been totally a global wake-up call. It has shed light on how the current food system and including, of course, the dairy ecosystem is broken and is in need of a radical transformation. So now when we're talking about the future of food and if we want to keep it intact, the, the change that needs to come is the smallholder farmers need to be empowered with the right knowledge, tools and resources which probably the, can only be possible via good technological solutions, right? And taking this into uh, opportunity, I believe, which is also one of uh, uh, MUFAM's value is collaboration for greater good. That is the opportunity now, right? So uh, we need like, for example, that's at uh, our personal goal as well. We need large global ecosystem players, especially led by women, uh, you know, they need to come together and champion the cause of zero hunger. If you want to actually achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030, we need to act now, right? And that's where, when, and especially when we talk about dairy, women farmers being so key, they are the key to adopt and spread the use of technology if we want a sustainable, nutritious, resilient, and inclusive food system. So let's, let's all collaborate together. And again, I would say, especially, you know, those uh, women farmers, because they play a very key role, women executives in nutrition, in dairy, in agriculture, and, and bring about this change, uh, you know. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Ashna. Actually, um, if you look at the poll, uh, one of the questions uh, is, if you could solve one of the SDGs right now, which would it be? And actually, the, uh, the SDG goal that has the most votes is zero hunger. So it looks like everybody agrees with, <laughs> <laughs> with, with that one there. Uh, Shahid, if you want to give us your insight. Uh, Shahid, you're on mute. Oops. Here, let me unmute. Okay. There you go. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, great. So basically, um, what I was uh, sharing, like um, the steps, we talked about uh, global food systems or the local food systems. Uh, uh, what I realized during the COVID-19, at least um, we didn't, the way everything was locked down, but the food system was not broken at that point. 
much because the farmers didn't stop production and uh, though they uh, lost a lot of uh, their uh, crops or uh, particularly for the, from the dairy and others uh, so i felt like that, that uh, uh, it was not uh, broken but uh, since the technology adoption was taken very seriously so i feel this will be the opportunity and opening up for adopting new technologies like the blockchain traceability those type of things which will now be more uh, faster than ever so i, I feel that is in a new dimension uh, we can pursue and the government and other agencies can look into uh, this perspective how to adopt new technologies in the agriculture sector and food system thank you thank you thank you shahid daytuna you want to wrap it up with your insight um I think for me, as I reflect about uh, your question, of course, or the insights I have, I, I think for me, mo mobile has really shown uh, it can be a critical uh, a platform for, for, all, uh, for everything that is happening around even uh, formalizing the food systems and the digital agriculture. Um, secondly, I think um, this is when we are seeing um, private uh, public partnerships uh, can really play a role in terms of uh, formalizing and making uh, the food systems more vertical, uh, more transparent, you know, and, and ensure that the, 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 the people who really matter, which are the smallholder farmers, are, are able to get their support, the right support they need in terms of financing, long-term assets, um, having their digital IDs um, uh, on their digital uh, platforms, and ensuring that they have the right um, key procurement, um, you know, traceability technologies that, that can actually help them help them digitize um yeah so for me i think those two uh, ppps and uh, mobile pl plays a critical role yeah thank you thank you so much Zaytuna. and and all all the panelists thank you so much for taking the time to join us um so i just want to uh let the audience members know that this recording will also be available um, on online on our webinar page. I'm just going to pull the link <laughs> for you now. Um, and uh, also just, um, there's a couple other links I want to share with you too. Um, first of all, if you, if you uh, do like this, this, this chat and also want to see a little bit more of our work, um, the big data platforms work, um, we've also just released our um, 2019 annual report and there's some fantastic projects there that you can also take a look at of some of the interventions that we have been supporting over the last few years. Um, so I, please you're, feel free to, to take a look there. I also want to invite you to um, our convention um, this year. So each year we have a annual convention where we have, uh, se uh, you know, several hundred attendees uh, join us. We had one in Nairobi as well uh, a couple of years ago, and last year it was in Hyderabad. Um, and this year, unfortunately, we were not able to to host in Peru as planned. Um, but that's great news for for everybody because. Um, now we are hosting a fully virtual um, and fully accessible event online. Um, the registration is free as well. Um, there is a limited number of tickets. So if you are um, considering joining us, I really recommend that you um, register as soon as possible. I'm just going to pop the link in now into the chat. Um, where, where it is. <laughs> uh, here we are. So yes, please register. Um, and I'm just going to also share with you the page for our webinars so that you can check in there um, over the next week or so. We'll be posting the recording. Uh, we're a little bit slow with some of the recordings um, uh, of the last sessions, but we should be posting them up in the next week. Um, so, so that's basically it. Um, please remember uh, to fill out your details in the Excel document as well if you want to connect with any of the other audience members and with the panelists too. Um, and uh, next week we'll, we'll be back here for another session. So we hope that you can all join us then. Um, thank you again so much to our panelists um, for taking the time. Um, and to everybody else, have a great day or evening wherever you are. Um, and we'll see you back here next week. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.
Thank you. Bye.